Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus utters some pretty serious rebukes, uh, the ones with the Pharisees come to mind. But perhaps none are as shocking as the one that he utters to Peter in our Gospel reading today. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Can you imagine the Lord Jesus saying that to you? <laughs> uh, the last thing that we would want to hear, very severe. What provokes Jesus uh, to use such strong language? I think to find out, we need to know a bit of the context. So just before our reading starts today, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter responds, you are the Messiah. And Jesus kind of nods in the affirmative and says, don't tell anybody. Why? Why the secret about his identity as the Messiah? The answer, I think, lies in the messianic expectations of the Jewish people in the first century. Messiah, or the Greek equivalent, Christ, means anointed one. And really, there were three types of anointed ones in the Old Testament. Uh, there were pro uh, prophets, priests, and kings. So, the messianic expectation of the Jewish people included a prophetic figure who would speak the very words of God. The expectations included a priestly figure that would atone for the sins of the people. And their expectations included a kingly figure, a son of David. Now, this kingly expectation wasn't necessarily understood by all Jewish groups as being a strictly worldly political kingship. Prophet Daniel, for example, spoke of a semi-divine type figure, a son of man who would come in the clouds of heaven. But whether political or spiritual, I don't think that many would have believed that the Messiah of Israel would be the same figure as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who would be bruised for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And there certainly was a political stream of messianic expectation, a hope that the Messiah would come to overthrow the Romans, to establish the throne of David, to put down Israel's enemies, oust the Gentiles from the land, and usher in a kind of golden era of peace and prosperity for the nation of Israel. So Peter would probably have had these types of associations in his mind these types of worldly expectations or human concerns, to use the words of Jesus, he would have associated these things with the word Messiah. And I think that's part of the reason why Jesus wanted to keep his identity as the Messiah a secret. Jesus was a king, to be sure. But as the Palm Sunday liturgy states, his crown was of thorns and his throne a cross. He says in, in the Gospel of John, my kingdom is not of this world. So he was not a king in the worldly political sense. He came not to overthrow the Gentiles and rule over a land, but to overthrow sin and death and the devil and to rule our hearts in love. But the disciples didn't understand this yet. Uh, and I, I don't blame them because I don't think we really understand this yet either. At least I don't. But I don't think the disciples could have conceived of a Messiah that must be willingly tortured and impaled by their oppressors. We might say that they had somewhat misplaced messianic expectations. We'll return to that. So when Jesus begins to teach openly and plainly, that the Son of Man must, isn't that a strong word there? The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. When he starts to teach this openly, Peter is scandalized. What type of Messiah must suffer and be rejected and be killed? So the text says that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. The Greek for took him aside connotes a kind of aggressive taking of Jesus to himself. We might imagine Peter saying something like, listen, Jesus, you got to stop talking like that. All this death and suffering and stuff. 
he kind of pulls Jesus to himself and says, look, you just stick with me, stay behind me, and I'm not going to let any of that stuff happen to you. Remember last week, Rob mentioned how in the temptation in the wilderness, Satan was trying to de derail Jesus from his redemptive mission. And albeit unwillingly, unwill that is exactly what Peter is doing in our gospel today. Unwittingly, he's trying to prevent Jesus from what he came to do. Peter, the rock, has become a boulder in the way, an obstacle to the very gospel itself. Now, all the disciples are looking on during this exchange. And, you know, Peter is very excitable and excited, and there's this big thing. He's rebuking the master, and everyone's looking at this going, what's Jesus going to do? So because they're all looking on, and because Peter has got it precisely backwards, Jesus steps in and clarifies in no uncertain terms. Verse 33, it says, when, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He calls him Satan because Satan is the Lord's adversary. Satan is the one who tries, albeit in vain, to foil the Lord's redemptive plans. So when Peter aggressively pulls Jesus to himself, Jesus says, no, 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 Peter, you get behind me. Get behind me. Note he doesn't just say, get out of my way. He doesn't just say, get out of my way, uh, Peter. I'm going to the cross. He says, get behind me, come after me, follow me. Peter, if you are with me, there's a very real sense in which you're coming too. If you're with me, you will suffer. You will be rejected. You will die to yourself and rise a new man. No, the NIV doesn't quite capture this, but the Greek word for get behind is the same word as the one down in verse 34. In verse 34, the NIV has Jesus saying, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But the ESV is closer to the original, I think. Whoever wants to come after me, get behind me, it's the same word, must take up their cross and follow me. So Jesus says to Peter, get behind me. And then he says to the disciples, whoever would come behind me must pick up their cross and follow me. I think this probably would have been a tough blow for Peter and the disciples. And they still don't get it. A few chapters later, they're going to be arguing about who's the greatest. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who can sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand when he comes into his kingdom? They're thinking they're going to ride Jesus' coattails into high positions in the Davidic court. They're thinking if Jesus is going to be king, we're going to be his entourage. They have visions of glory and power and the praise of people. They haven't yet internalized Jesus' words. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And again, I can't blame the disciples here, because most of the time, I don't get it either. I can so easily slip into misplaced or misguided messianic expectations. And I wonder if you can relate to me. I think in our time, we tend to have expectations of Jesus in two main ways. We may have political expectations of Jesus, but even more than that, I think we hope that Jesus will be our circumstantial Messiah and our therapeutic Messiah. And we have these expectations of him, that he's going to save us in our circumstances and in our uh, state of mind. First, our circumstantial Messiah. Many of us, I think, including myself, have a messianic expectation, even subconsciously, that Jesus is going to adjust my circumstances for the better. We have deep hopes and longings, and many of these hopes and longings are for very, very good things. 
We, we, we may want to be married. We may have a longing for children. We may want a certain career. We may want a home to build, to have a certain standard of life. We may long for to be released from unhealth. We want to be healthy. We want a functional family life. And deep down in a subconscious level even, we view our relationship with Jesus as transactional. So we pray and we try to be good and we come to church and we tithe. And our expectation is that Jesus is going to look after our circumstances. But Jesus never promises to be our circumstantial Messiah. In fact, he calls us to get behind him on the road to the cross. To pick up our cross and follow him. To suffer many things. To be rejected. To die to ourselves. And to rise again as new people in him. Nor does he promise to be our therapeutic Messiah. To grant us happiness or complete freedom from all mental afflictions in this life, or to never experience fear or anxiety or worry. Not even he was free from those things during his earthly ministry. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was so full of anxiety that sweat fell from his face like great drops of blood. And he was God. So to follow him doesn't mean we will experience total peace of mind in this life. So, if the promise isn't that Jesus is going to be our circumstantial Messiah, and the promise isn't that he's going to be our therapeutic Messiah, what does he promise? In short, himself. He promises himself. Reconciliation with him. Union with him. And that union begins to make us like him so that we can understand our life as a sacrificial offering like his. And the, the problem is we often don't seek Jesus. We seek what he can give us. And I think this is our natural state as humans. And I think this is essentially what paganism is. We're the center of our life. We appeal to the gods, or God, or Jesus, to make our life better than it is now. We sacrifice to the gods, or live according to the law, or assent intellectually to some beliefs. And in return, the gods give us good crops, or rain, or blessings, or health, or long life, or whatever. And the modern equivalent is that our life is ours. We are our own. And in a sense, we are self-creating. And we reach out to different things and may even sacrifice considerably in order to get a better life. We pursue a career, a spouse, a family, a church, exercise, counseling, and Jesus is one of those things. One piece of our happiness puzzle. And we add him to our life for the potential benefits. I do this. But this is not biblical Christianity. <laughs> In biblical Christianity, Christ is our life. The goal is him. We don't sacrifice to get what we want from him. He sacrifices himself to remove all barriers to union with us forever. Paul was able to say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I don't think I can say that yet but I pray that one day I can, maybe when he comes again. <laughs> what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Let me take a stab at an analogy here. Let's say Carly uh, came to me. Where is she? There she is. And she said, I've found a way, Grady, to give you everything that you need. I can give you enough money. I can give you the career you want. I can give you a long, healthy life. I can give you freedom from anxiety and depression. I can give you contentment. But to get all these things, Carly says to me, I have to move to the other side of the world. I can no longer be with you. 
Now, in a heartbeat, I would say, no deal. <laughs> Honey, I will take you, your presence with me, your union with me, your love over all that other stuff. In fact, your presence will strengthen me to bear those other things and actually will give meaning to those other things. I would rather have you. And if that's true of a human being, who tomorrow, and God forbid, something could happen, she could get sick, you know, and I could lose her. But if that's true of her, a human being, how much more with God, who's the source and ground of all existence? He's truth and goodness and beauty himself from which all true, good, and beautiful things flow. And to choose transitory things over him is to refuse life itself. And this is what our first reading from the book of Romans is all about. Let me read parts of it for you. Remember, we often ask God, remove trouble, remove hardship, remove persecution, remove famine, remove nakedness, remove danger, remove sword. This is what Paul says. What then shall we say in response? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? No. In, more these th in, all, in, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nothing, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, it's good news. The great question this morning is this. Are we pursuing Jesus for what he can give us? perhaps with misguided messianic expectations? Or are we pursuing Jesus for himself? If I'm being totally honest, most of the time, I'm probably pursuing Jesus for what he can give me. To pursue Jesus for himself means that we are signing up to pick up our cross, to suffer many things, to be rejected, to die to ourselves and to be raised to life anew, but we get him. What does it mean to bear our cross? Not his cross, mind you, our cross. His cross redeems the world. Our cross doesn't do that, but he does use our crosses for his redemptive purposes. Each cross is unique. The one thing we definitely shouldn't do is look around and say, I'd rather have that one. <laughs> Well, some of us here may be asking the question, what about my dreams, my hopes? What about the career I want? What about my health? What about my deepest longings? It, is it okay to long and pray for those things? I would say, yes, it is. It's okay to pray for those things. We see this all over the Psalms. It's good to pour out our hearts to God, to say, Lord, my heart's desire is X. Please, Lord, grant me this desire. God knows it anyway. We might as well be honest with him. But I think what makes it a Christian prayer and not a pagan prayer is the model Jesus gives us in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is so encouraging to me. He's about to pick up his cross. What does he pray? My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. This is what I want, Lord. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. That's not a pagan prayer. I think that's the quintessential Christian prayer. Jesus, I long to be married. I long for a family. I've been trying so hard at working in this particular field, but there's no fruit. I want to stay in Vancouver. I want to be free of suffering. I want to be healed. I want you to change my circumstances. I want freedom from what afflicts me. Father, if it's possible, grant me this. Yet not my will, but yours be done. It could be that God puts some of our deep desires and longings in there for us to pursue. 
It could be that he's going to answer those the, the way that we want. Or it could be that he's going to use those longings and desires as a cross to pick up and bear for our good and our growth and our sanctification to bless us with himself and through that cross to equip us to bless others to the glory of God. And here's the thing. The most important things that we long for in life are actually crosses in themselves. <laughs> Marriage, for example. I just spoke wonderfully about my wife, who I would never give up for a million anything. But Christian marriage isn't for making us happy or fulfilled. It's the arena wherein we die to ourselves for the sake of the other. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So for the Christian, even when God grants our desires, that granting is not just to please us or relieve us. It's our next cross to pick up. It's a form of sacrificial love. We know that when we have kids, we long for kids, but when they arrive, we're like, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, take it away. <laughs> right? That's not true, kids. That's not true. <laughs> but it's hard. It requires us dying to ourselves for the sake of the other. Three times Paul asked God to remove a thorn from his flesh, something that afflicted him. But the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, he says, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's the paradox of Christianity. Those who save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life will, for Jesus and the gospel will save it. I'm not saying this is easy, and I'm not saying that I even understand this. I don't. I don't fully understand this, and I'm certainly not living into this. Do I delight in weakness, insults, hardships? Not yet. But I'm going to start by asking for the grace to bear those things with trust and patience. And as a church, we can do this together. Isn't that wonderful? What a gift. We can encourage one another in these things, and we can go through these things together as the body of Christ. We don't just pick up our cross and go it alone. We do it together. Just, just one more thing, and I'm, I'm through. Many Christian spiritual writers talk about kind of the path of discipleship. And they talk about how, you know, when you, I don't know if this is your experience, but when you become a Christian, uh, it, it comes with a lot of wonderful feelings, right? You, you feel a lot of joy. You feel a lot of what the spiritual writers call consolations. God gives you this overwhelming feeling, uh, kind of like falling in love. But what, what the spiritual writers say is that in every Christian life, there comes a moment where God removes those consolations from us. Why? Why would he do that? He does that, the mystics say, so that we be begin to pursue God for God and not for the gifts that he gives us. So it's, it's actually a sign that God is drawing you into the next phase of maturity in your Christian life. He's, he hasn't left you, you know. He's, he's saying, okay, I'm with you. I've died for you. You're mine. Now, now, come follow me. Come follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Maybe he's doing that with some of 